Well, hello there. I'm a middle-aged autistic woman. Navigating the world as an autistic person often requires a lot of passing as neurotypical, especially if you're a lady expected to smile and do a disproportionate amount of social and emotional labor. In this video, I present the three ways that I personally have managed to hide my autism, including from myself. I figured out pretty young that I was a weirdo, but I also figured out that being a weirdo doesn't have to be bad. Lots of weirdos are regarded as lovable and even cool in their own way. If I could just find the right style, I could project an acceptable, quirky persona. When I was a kid, I was complimented for my unique style and confidence. At least that's how I interpreted people saying stuff like, it's so cool how you don't care what other people think. Of course, it's possible people were making fun of me behind my back my whole childhood. But if so, I was oblivious because I lacked the social skills to recognize it. So it all worked out. Until my mid-30s, I remained convinced that I was that confident gal who always did her own thing without needing approval from others. When I was in high school, one of my uncles expressed concern for how my odd style might make it hard for me to get a job. But I had an answer for that ready. I was going to become an artist. Now to be clear, I became an artist because I love making art. And while growing up, I was repeatedly told that I am good at it. However, being a professional artist provides additional benefits for people with ASD. One is that artists are expected to be eccentric. Tom Wolfe referred to modern artists as bohemians who engaged in the boho dance of stylishly dressing down and expressing contempt for popular culture and class structures. Not necessarily in earnest, but because it attracts wealthy art collectors. At the age of 17, before I ever read any Tom Wolfe, I said to my uncle, people expect artists to be weird. If I'm not, people won't think my art is any good, so being weird will actually help with my career. My uncle considered this and then nodded, impressed with my logic. Another benefit of being a professional artist for people with ASD is that it is not a 9 to 5 job that requires daily social interactions with colleagues and bosses. Visual artists tend to isolate ourselves in our studios and we're our own bosses. So long as we're producing work, regularly applying for and occasionally landing shows, fellowships, residencies, grants, or awards, we can claim professional credibility and build a resume that proves our worth. This is all great, with just one problem. Making a living as a visual artist is incredibly difficult for anyone and the success of the few who make it requires the investment of a lot of actual money or a ton of social capital. So while I might be good at making art, I have some disadvantages when it comes to selling art. But hey, even the minority of artists who manage to make a living off their art spent years developing quality bodies of work and building up their platforms. So my artistic ambitions bought me a lot of time that I first spent studying and training. No shame in that. To pay the bills, I worked a lot of part-time, short-term, and indie contractor gigs. So it all worked out. You see, oftentimes people with ASD who can pass as neurotypical have no problem landing a job, especially if we've acquired some marketable skills. It's keeping the job that's often an issue. My experience is a bit of a vicious cycle. I find a job that sounds agreeable, and I'm excited to apply. And then I get the job, and it starts out fine. I do my work well, but then everything slowly goes south. I become increasingly stressed out and develop severe headache and increasingly severe anxiety attacks, and it all culminates in an overall and relentless feeling of dread, at which point I begin frantically coming up with any good reason to quit that job. But this is not a disaster. The trick is to always leave before they figure out what's really going on with me. I have never burned bridges. I always leave these jobs on good terms with professionally stated reasons for departure. 
and almost always these reasons are connected to advancements in my career. Sometimes I go out and find some other job opportunity that I can argue is a step that I simply must take. My former employers and colleagues always understand, and I walk away with my head held high, knowing I'll have good references. By the time I turned 30, these strategies were working out reasonably well for me. Sure, my income was way below average for my level of experience and education, but I had a financial safety net in my family. And against the odds, a strong relationship with a life partner who I could pool resources with. So it all worked out. Then we had kids. In a dual income household with young children, the partner who earns less money almost inevitably becomes the primary caretaker. And that's me! That role brought an influx of regular social interactions with new people, doctors, dentists, teachers, and other parents. Within a couple of years, all that additional social interaction meant my levels of stress were skyrocketing. So I brought out a trusty old coping mechanism, always being busy. Work is a great way to limit social interactions, as well as overcompensate for insecurities, because everyone respects a busy person. I can't tell you how many times someone has said to me, I don't know how you do it all. A couple friends have even called me a superwoman, and that feels good. After over a decade of performing well at teaching artist gigs for over a dozen arts organizations in the local area, I am frequently offered more opportunities for other gigs. I'm asked to sub for colleagues. I'm invited to participate in group shows or to teach classes and workshops. Of course, none of these jobs by themselves pay very much, if they pay at all, but if I do a whole bunch of them, it adds up. If I get irritable or have meltdowns at home at the end of every day, it's just the stress of balancing a demanding and complicated schedule. See, it's all working out. And there we have it, the three ways I hide my being autistic. One, cultivate a fake personality. Two, take on an impossible career. And three, become a workaholic. Hopefully it's clear at this point that I am not advocating these three strategies. They are not healthy. The reason I got a late in life ASD diagnosis was because I wasn't healthy and I sought help from mental health professionals in order to find better coping mechanisms. However, I can't deny that these three strategies, along with support from my family, were also necessary for me to achieve and maintain a position in life that gives me a sense of self-worth and relative financial stability. Passing as neurotypical is useful for things like job interviews and casual interactions with acquaintances, but it's utterly useless when it comes to forming deep, long-lasting relationships, and most of us also need those to survive. Also, passing in long stretches is stressful, but just letting loose and being ourselves all the time also has serious drawbacks, particularly when it comes to social capital. Social capital refers to all the networks of relationships within a society. A lot has been studied and written about how important the social capital of an individual is with regards to flourishing, or even just surviving. Most adults with ASD are all too aware of the dismal statistics on us obtaining and keeping full-time employment. As should be expected, the statistics are worse for young adults, racial minorities, and people from low-income communities. If you couldn't tell, I'm a rather privileged white woman. My family is super supportive. I have no physical or intellectual disabilities, and obviously I can communicate pretty well. Even so, at the age of 42, I've still never held a single full-time job for more than a year. There are so many ways my path could have taken a turn for the worst, not least of which is ending up without a supportive life partner, or worse, in an abusive relationship. My story isn't all that different from many of the success stories of entrepreneurs with ASD that get written about again and again and again. 
The messaging that usually accompanies these stories is self-help bullshit, of course. These are narratives that we tell to convince ourselves that anyone can be successful if we just find our individual strengths, aim high, and work hard enough. But the truth is, these stories are exceptions that prove the rule. That's why they're newsworthy. Not too long ago, I attended a talk by Temple Grandin, one of the most famous living autistic people. She has a PhD in animal science, has designed systems for more humane treatment of livestock, and has written numerous best-selling books on both animals and autism. She's given a ton of interviews, a TED Talk, and there's even a movie about her life starring Claire Danes. Temple Grandin is an incredibly accomplished individual. As impressed as I am by her accomplishments, the aspect of her life that struck me the most was her early childhood. As a toddler, she was diagnosed as brain damaged and experts recommended institutionalizing. Her mother refused to accept that and instead rigorously worked with her daughter and hired other people to also work with her, teaching her to speak. When I heard about everything that Temple Grandin's mother did to help her daughter achieve so much more than what was expected of someone with her condition, I assumed her family was quite wealthy, and I assumed correctly. At the talk I attended, Temple Grandin, speaking to an audience of mainly autistic people and their families, emphasized the importance of developing good habits, discipline, life skills, and a strong work ethic. During the Q&A, one parent expressed concern that her daughter didn't have any friends. Grandin was utterly dismissive and insisted that friends aren't necessary. Such a response from a woman who grew up wealthy and well-supported shouldn't be too surprising. While most people who struggle to make ends meet depend on social networks, friendships weren't anything Temple Grandin ever absolutely needed. The thing is, not needing friends is a pretty privileged position to be in. As a teaching artist, I mainly work with low-income populations. The services that low-income kids with ASD get don't compare to what Temple Grandin's mother and their family's wealth provided. Many autistic advocates for the disabled have become critical of functional labels because too often so-called high-functioning autistic people end up being denied services and are expected to pass and compete in the same playing field with neurotypical people. Sometimes we're expected to perform at an even higher level because we can be stereotyped as savants. And while autistic savants are more common than savants in the general population, 90% of autistic people do not have any extraordinary abilities. Temple Grandin has a tendency to encourage this stereotype, saying things like, without autism traits, we might all be living in caves. Functional labeling also means that so-called low-functioning autistic people are designated disabled and are thereby rendered permanently dependent and given few opportunities. Unless family or friends supplement their standard of living, they can be institutionalized and live their whole lives in poverty. Temple Grandin has received criticism from some in the autistic community for promoting ableist attitudes against autistic people who cannot compete in this economy because she says things like, in an ideal world, the scientist should find a method to prevent the most severe forms of autism, but allow the milder forms to survive. Prevent the most severe? Isn't that what she would have been labeled had she not had her mom as an advocate and the resources provided by her family's wealth? How many autistic people are lower functioning as a direct consequence of the conditions of their poverty? Also, autism is a neurological difference, not a disease. Neurodiversity advocates, led by many actual autistic people, don't want a cure. They don't want prevention. They want support, acceptance, and inclusion in society. For instance, the activist Mel Baggs, who passed away earlier this year, aimed to show the world that severely disabled people live lives just as rich and valuable as anyone else. In 2007, Bags created a moving short film titled In My Language, where they themselves are shown engaged in various often repetitive movements such as rocking and waving their hands. In the second half, Bags gives a voiceover translation of the same footage, which shatters assumptions about the nature and meaning of these behaviors. While statements such as these from Temple Grandin are disappointing because I admire her for many reasons. 
I'm also pretty used to Americans who utterly lack class consciousness and believe in the myth of meritocracy, especially when they're among the more affluent who can live blissfully ignorant of real economic hardship. Like so many who achieved much success under our current socioeconomic system, Grandin wants to believe her success is mainly a result of her personal character and her intellect and hard work. She does not seem to want to consider that her personal character, intellect, and hard work were enabled by fortunate circumstances. Nor does she seem to want to consider that her less fortunate counterparts are languishing in institutions. When we learn the stories of people like Temple Grandin, why don't we all think about how lucky she was to not only have a loving, persistent mother, but the wealth, the resources to help her thrive? Why aren't those supposedly inspiring stories of people who overcome great adversity a wake-up call to how screwed up it is that anyone has to compete to fulfill basic needs and that disadvantaged people are just expected to work harder for less? Take a moment and really think about what that's saying about all the people begging for donations on GoFundMe. The value of human beings cannot and should not be ranked, and the first priority of any society should be to adequately meet the basic human needs of everyone. That's not just food and shelter, it's also having a role in society where we have dignity and value. Under our current socioeconomic system, the best case scenario for most autistic people is regularly having to choose between our mental health and our financial survival. And here's the funny thing. That's the situation most neurotypical people are in too, just to a lesser degree. Nobody except the rich can opt out of this system because we all need to eat and have somewhere to sleep at night and we all need to feel like we're worth something. And yes, some of us will come out moderate or even big winners in this economy. But if and when we succeed, we'll be part of a lucky minority and our success will have everything to do with circumstances and nothing to do with our intrinsic and profound value as human beings. And now we are all set up. You know, I haven't played Monopoly in years, but I sort of remember there being railroads. Star Wars Monopoly!